438, Chapter 52 of The Count of Monte Cristo. Book talk begins at 648. Welcome to Craplet, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 437. Oh no, not again. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. I hope you are well. I hope you are better than my internet at my home. Yes, once again, the internet is out, which means I am recording, putting this audio file onto a laptop, going to a Starbucks, using their Wi-Fi to upload it to Justin, who will then save my life again. And now, happily, I seem to have located the source of the problem. It is the Comcast modem and router. This will be the eighth one we have gotten in this house. We have surge protectors like you wouldn't believe on this sucker. There is nothing external that has affected our routers in any way. It's just Comcast. We only have one choice because we're sort of rural where we are, and so we're stuck. And I am so done (laughs) with computer problems and internet problems. Makes it a little hard to get things done when you do work for hire that has to be transmitted electronically. That aside, however, the real problem is that all of my research for today's episode is locked on a device that can't access the internet anymore. So I'm going to go from memory and I will put links in the show notes so that you can go get truly accurate information on a couple of these things because this week's episode has some really interesting stuff in it. I also, before everything decided to fall apart here, I was also able to do a crafty chat this week with Erica, the first one of 2017, and we had a great time sharing stuff, but I can't access that either. So instead, I am going to tell you my favorite crafty cleaning tip. We were down in Virginia at my friend Karen and Jonathan's, and They had just moved into this new place that had been in the hands of the same owner for 30 years, which means the place hadn't been really, really cleaned. Or, no, I need to amend that. It hadn't been completely cleared out and cleaned for 30 years. That's a long time. And there were places in the tile in the kitchen that clearly had not seen a sponge for a while. So, poor Karen, who is a cleaning goddess, was at her wit's end, and I had just found an article on the internet when it worked explaining how to clean bathroom grout in a way that was potentially more powerful than other methods you might come across, and yet non-toxic. And Karen has kids. I have kids. Non-toxic is good. It is this. Take a cup of white vinegar Stick that cup of white vinegar in a microwave. Put it on high until the vinegar starts to boil. Carefully remove the vinegar. Put it into a spray bottle. Add one, an empty spray bottle, not just any spray bottle full of 409 or something like that. No, put it into an empty spray bottle if you have one, and I have a caveat after. Pour one cup of Dawn dishwashing detergent because Dawn takes grease out of your way. This is what we use on sheep wool as well. Put a cup of Dawn dishwashing detergent in that sucker. Mix it up. I used a bamboo skewer for like making shish kebabs because that's what I had. Mix it up and the heat of the vinegar allows it to bond with the Dawn dishwashing detergent because Dawn's pretty thick and vinegar is pretty vinegary and it would take a long time to get to an emulsive state, evidently, if you don't heat the vinegar up. But the other thing somebody said online about the vinegar being heated is that it makes that emulsive state 
more permanent than it might have been otherwise. I don't know if that's true or not. All I know is you wouldn't want to heat it up when it was mixed with the Dawn because you'd have a foamy microwave, number one. Number two, it didn't seem to need to be heated up again. However, the website that I read said to take the spray bottle and spray it on the grout using the stream function instead of the spray function on the bottle and let it sit for a minute and then wipe it away. On most things, that worked great. On really caked on like grime and you know how if you fry food once in your kitchen, you're going to get greasy residue on cabinets and things like that. This stuff cut right through that. Not without a little bit of elbow grease, mind you, but it it cut through it when other cleaners didn't. It also cleaned the grout, although I did have to get in there with a scrub brush and and really go after it, which is also fine. I did not have a spray bottle the first time I tried this. So I mixed half a cup of boiling vinegar and half a cup of Dawn in a cup. And I had my scrubby toothbrush, the one that I use for scrubbing things. And that's all I used on the grout the first time around. And yep. Wow. Wow. <laughs> did, that, did that clean the grout? <laughs> oh, was that scary. So that is it. Your crafty cleaning tip for the week. I am so in love. I knew I loved Dawn. And I knew I love vinegar because vinegar and baking soda, that, you know, opens many a drain. But mixing the two together, <laughs> the two things I love most in the cleaning world was really surprisingly revelatory and it, it made me squeal. So that is what I pass on to you today. Okay, today's chapter, chapter 52, is called Snape's Classroom. No, no, it's not. It's called Toxicology. <laughs> <laughs> it is Snape's Poisons. It's one of my favorite chapters, partly because I love the way that it's written, and I love the way that there are still surprises that we get to experience, even though we, we've followed the Count for quite a while now, and we saw him in Italy, and we've seen him in France, and we saw his inception down in Marseille when he left the Morel family and turned his eye towards vengeance. But that doesn't mean we know everything about him. I mean, we know a little bit. We have some idea that he traveled in the East or what would have been considered the East at the time. There's still little surprises that Dumas has for us. But the surprises do not simply surround the Count. We have surprises coming in today. If you listen closely, you will pick up on. Because in today's chapter, they are, for the most part, subtle and 100% connected to characterization. If you have been, as a student in school, confused by characterization and why teachers go on about it for so long, and there's internal characterization and external characterization and this, that, and the other thing, I have a feeling that this chapter will elucidate why teachers get so excited about this. Because there's what you learn from what the people say, and there's what you learn from what the people don't say. And there's what you learn from the, they're not 100% asides, they're more like she mused or he mumbled or she said under her breath. You get those kind of theatrical moments and you learn a lot about them from that. So we're going to play a game. And the game we're going to play is reading for meaning. For those of you who are teachers, I got this out of the book called Core 6. It's by mm, Silver, Mr. Silver. And at first I thought, reading for meaning, that's a lame name for a reading strategy. And I continue to maintain my position on that because everybody reads for meaning. Duh. What you're really going to do is listen for evidence. And, and the way this works is if I were teaching in a classroom, I would put on the board or the overhead or the smart board a statement. And the statement could be true or it could be false. And I don't say which one it is. The student's job in the classroom, or your job heading into this chapter, would be to read for or to listen for support for or against that statement. Think about that for a minute. Let's just take To Kill a Mockingbird. If you get to the chapter where Atticus has to deal with the rabid dog. If the statement I gave the students was, Atticus may be smart and well-read, but when it comes to real life and the problems that confront us in it, 
he's a complete loser. Find support for or against. There are plenty of kids in class who, prior to that chapter, would have agreed with that statement just off the cuff on their own. But forcing them to look for support for or against that statement in that particular chapter where Atticus has to pick up the gun and where we learn, again, characterization a lot about Atticus, that would force them to not only find meaning, new meaning in that chapter, but then de facto, they just have to start looking back at the assumptions that they made about his character for the previous chapters. It's a wonderful kind of head-turning exercise. Now, we aren't in a situation like that with our characters today. Nothing, nothing is going to happen with the Count that is going to surprise you overly much. But there are assumptions about women that were held at the time, 1835, 1838, and are in some cases still held now about women. So our statement for reading today that you will find support for or against is this. While women can become easily angered by and frustrated with the people around them, it would take an extraordinary slight or insult to their character or family to move them to act from those feelings. Okay? Women can get angered or frustrated easily with people around them, but it would take something extraordinary to push them into action as a response to those feelings. That's what you're going to listen for today. And today's chapter is called Toxicology. Chapter 52. Toxicology. It was really the Count of Monte Cristo who had just arrived at Madame de Villefort's for the purpose of returning the procureur's visit. And at his name, as may be easily imagined, the whole house was in confusion. Madame de Villefort who was alone in her drawing-room when the Count was announced, desired that her son might be brought thither instantly to renew his thanks to the Count. And Edward, who heard this great personage talked of for two whole days, made all possible haste to come to him, not from obedience to his mother, or out of any feeling of gratitude to the Count, but from sheer curiosity, and that some chance remark might give him the opportunity for making one of the impertinent speeches which made his mother say, "'Oh, that naughty child, but I can't be severe with him. He is really so bright.' After the usual civilities, the Count inquired after Monsieur de Villefort. "'My husband dines with the Chancellor,' replied the young lady. "'He has just gone, and I am sure he'll be exceedingly sorry not to have had the pleasure of seeing you before he went.' Two visitors, who were there when the Count arrived, having gazed at him with all their eyes, retired after that reasonable delay which politeness admits, and curiosity requires. "'What is your sister Valentine doing?' inquired Madame de Villefort of Edward. "'Tell someone to bid her come here, that I may have the honour of introducing her to the Count.' "'You have a daughter, then, Madame?' inquired the Count." "'Very young, I presume. "'The daughter of Monsieur de Villefort by his first marriage,' replied the young wife. "'A fine, well-grown girl.' "'But melancholy,' interrupted Master Edward, "'snatching the feathers out of the tail of a splendid paroquet "'that was screaming on its gilded perch "'in order to make a plume for his hat. "'Madame de Villefort merely cried, "'Be still, Edward,' she then added, this young madcap is, however, very nearly right, and Milly re-echoes what he has heard me say with pain a hundred times. For Mademoiselle de Villefort is, in spite of all we can do to rouse her, of a melancholy disposition and taciturn habit, which frequently injure the effect of her beauty. But what detains her? Go, Edward, and see. Because they are looking for her where she is not to be found. "'And where are you looking for her?' "'With Grandpa Noitier. "'And do you think she is not there?' "'No, no, 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 she is not there,' replied Edward, singing his words. "'And where is she, then? "'If you know, why don't you tell?' "'She is under the big chestnut-tree,' replied the spoiled brat, 
as he gave in spite of his mother's commands live flies to the parrot which seemed keenly to relish such fare madame de villefort stretched out her hand to ring intending to direct her waiting-maid to the spot where she would find valentine when the young lady herself entered the apartment she appeared much dejected and any person who considered her attentively might have observed the traces of recent tears in her eyes valentine whom we have in the rapid march of our narrative presented to our readers without formally introducing her was a tall and graceful girl of nineteen with bright chestnut hair deep blue eyes and that reposeful air of quiet distinction which characterized her mother her white and slender fingers her pearly neck her cheeks tinted with varying hues reminded one of the lovely english women who have been so poetically compared in their manner to the gracefulness of a swan she entered the apartment and seeing near her stepmother the stranger of whom she had already heard so much saluted him without any girlish awkwardness or even lowering her eyes and with an elegance that redoubled the count's attention he rose to return the salutation mademoiselle de villefort my daughter-in-law said madame de villefort to monte cristo leaning back on her sofa and motioning towards valentine with her hand and monsieur de monte cristo king of china emperor of cochin china said the young imp looking slyly towards his sister madame de villefort at this really did turn pale and was very nearly angry with this household plague who answered to the name of edward but the count on the contrary smiled and appeared to look at the boy complacently which caused the maternal heart to bound again with joy and enthusiasm but madame replied the count continuing the conversation and looking by turns at madame de villefort and valentine have i not already had the honour of meeting yourself and mademoiselle before i could not help thinking so just now the idea came over my mind and as mademoiselle entered the sight of her was an additional ray of light thrown on a confused remembrance excuse the remark i do not think it likely sir mademoiselle de villefort is not very fond of society and we very seldom go out said the young lady then it was not in society that i met with mademoiselle or yourself madame or this charming little merry boy besides the parisian world is entirely unknown to me for as i believe i told you i have been in paris for very few days no but perhaps you will permit me to call to mind stay the count placed his hand on his brow as if to collect his thoughts no uh, it was somewhere away from here it was i do not know but it appears that this recollection is connected with a lovely sky and some religious fete mademoiselle was holding flowers in her hand the interesting boy was chasing a beautiful peacock in a garden and you madame were under the trellis of some arbor pray come to my aid madame do not these circumstances appeal to your memory no indeed replied madame de villefort and yet it appears to me sir that if i had met you anywhere the recollection of you must have been imprinted on my memory perhaps the count saw us in italy said valentine timidly yes in italy it was in italy most probably replied monte cristo you have travelled then in italy mademoiselle yes madame and i were there two years ago the doctors anxious for my lungs uh, prescribed the air of naples we went by bologna perugia and rome ah yes true mademoiselle exclaimed monte cristo as if this simple explanation was sufficient to revive the recollection he sought it was at perugia on corpus christi day in the garden of the hotel de poste when chance brought us together you madame de villefort and her son i now remember having had the honour of meeting you i perfectly well remember perugia sir 
and the hotel de poste and the festival of which you speak said madame de villefort but in vain do i tax my memory of whose treachery i am ashamed for i really do not recall to mind that i ever had the pleasure of seeing you before it is strange but neither do i recollect meeting with you observed valentine raising her beautiful eyes to the count but i remember it perfectly interposed the darling edward i will assist your memory madame continued the count the day had been burning hot you were waiting for horses which were delayed in consequence of the festival mademoiselle was walking in the shade of the garden and your son disappeared in pursuit of the peacock and i caught it mamma don't you remember interposed edward and i pulled three such beautiful feathers out of his tail you madame remained under the arbor do you not remember that while you were seated on a stone bench and while as i told you mademoiselle de villefort and your young son were absent you conversed for a considerable time with somebody yes in truth yes answered the young lady turning very red i do remember conversing with a person wrapped in a long woolen mantle he was a medical man i think precisely so madame this man was myself for a fortnight i had been at the hotel during which period i had cured my valet de chambre of a fever and my landlord of the jaundice so that i really acquired a reputation as a skilful physician we discoursed a long time madame on different subjects of perugino of raffaele of manners customs of the famous aqua tofana of which they had told you i think you said that certain individuals in perugia had preserved the secret yes true replied madame de villefort somewhat uneasily i remember now i do not recollect now all the various subjects of which we discoursed madame continued the count with perfect calmness but i perfectly remember that falling into the error which others have entertained respecting me you consulted me as to the health of mademoiselle de villefort yes really sir you were in fact a medical man said madame de villefort since you had cured the sick moliere or beaumarchais would reply to you madame that it was precisely because i was not that i had cured my patients for myself i am content to say to you that i have studied chemistry and the natural sciences somewhat deeply but still only as an amateur you understand at this moment the clock struck six it is six o'clock said madame de villefort evidently agitated valentine will you not go and see if your grandpapa will have his dinner valentine rose and saluting the count left the apartment without speaking oh madame said the count where valentine had left the room was it on my account that you sent mademoiselle de villefort away by no means replied the young lady quickly but this is the hour when we usually give monsieur noirtier the unwelcome meal that sustains his pitiful existence you are aware sir of the deplorable condition of my husband's father yes madame monsieur de villefort spoke of it to me a paralysis i think alas yes the poor old gentleman is entirely helpless the mind alone is still active in this human machine and that is faint and flickering like the light of a lamp about to expire but excuse me sir for talking of our domestic misfortunes i interrupted you at the moment when you were telling me that you were a skilful chemist no madame i did not say as much as that replied the count with a smile quite the contrary i have studied chemistry because having determined to live in eastern climates i have been desirous of following the example of king mithridates mithridates rex ponticus said the young scamp as he tore some beautiful portraits out of a splendid album the individual who took cream in his cup of poison every morning at breakfast edward you naughty boy 
exclaimed Madame de Villefort, snatching the mutilated book from the urchin's grasp. "'You are positively past bearing. You really disturb the conversation. Go, leave us and join your sister Valentine in dear Grandpapa Noirtier's room.' "'The album,' said Edward sulkily. "'What do you mean, the album?' "'I want the album. "'How dare you tear out the drawings? "'Oh, it amuses me. "'Go, go at once.' "'I won't go unless you give me the album,' said the boy, "'seating himself doggedly in an armchair, "'according to his habit of never giving way. "'Take it, then, and pray disturb us no longer,' said Madame de Villefort, "'giving the album to Edward, who then went towards the door, led by his mother.' The Count followed her with his eyes. "'Let us see if she shuts the door after him,' he muttered. Madame de Villefort closed the door carefully after the child. The Count, appearing not to notice her, then casting a scrutinizing glance around the chamber, the young wife returned to her chair, in which she seated herself. "'Allow me to observe, madame,' said the Count, with that kind tone he could assume so well. "'You are really very severe with that dear, clever child.' "'Oh, sometimes severity is quite necessary,' replied Madame de Villefort, with all a mother's real firmness. "'It was his Cornelius Napos that Master Edward was repeating when he referred to King Mithridates,' continued the Count and you interrupted him in a quotation which proves that his tutor has by no means neglected him, for your son is really advanced for his years. "'The fact is, Count,' answered the mother, agreeably flattered, "'he has great aptitude, and learns all that is set before him. He has but one fault. He is somewhat willful. But really, on referring for the moment to what he said, do you truly believe that Mithridates used these precautions, and that these precautions were efficacious? I think so, madame, because I myself have made use of them, that I might not be poisoned at Naples, at Palermo, and at Smyrna. That is to say, on three several occasions when, but for these precautions, I must have lost my life. And... "'Your precautions were successful?' "'Completely so.' "'Yes, I remember now you mentioning to me at Perugia something of this sort.' "'Indeed,' said the Count, with an air of surprise, remarkably well counterfeited. "'I really did not remember.' "'I inquired of you if poisons acted equally, and with the same effect on men of the North as on men of the South.' and you answered me that the cold and sluggish habits of the north did not present the same aptitude as the rich and energetic temperaments of the natives of the south and that is the case observed monte cristo i have seen russians devour without being visibly inconvenienced vegetable substances which would infallibly have killed a neapolitan or an arab "'And you really believe the result would be still more sure with us than in the East, "'and in the midst of our fogs and rains, "'a man would habituate himself more easily than in a warm latitude "'to the progressive absorption of poison?' "'Certainly, it being at the same time perfectly understood "'that he should have been duly fortified against the poison to which he had not been accustomed.' "'Yes, I understand that.' "'And how would you habituate yourself, for instance? "'Or rather, how did you habituate yourself to it?' "'Oh, very easily. "'Suppose you knew beforehand the poison that would be made use of against you. "'Suppose the poison was, for instance, Brucine. "'Brucine is extracted from the false Aragostura, is it not?' inquired Madame de Villefort. "'Precisely, madame.' "'replied Monte Cristo. "'But I perceive I have not much to teach you. "'Allow me to compliment you on your knowledge. "'Such learning is very rare among ladies.' "'Oh, I am aware of that,' said Madame de Villefort. "'But I have a passion for the occult sciences, 
which speak to the imagination like poetry and are reducible to figures like an algebraic equation but go on i beg of you what you say interests me to the greatest degree well replied monte cristo suppose then that this poison was brucine and you were to take a milligram the first day two milligrams the second day and so on well at the end of ten days you would have taken a centigram at the end of twenty days increasing another milligram you would have taken three hundred centigrams that is to say a dose which you would support without inconvenience and which would be very dangerous for any other person who had not taken the same precautions as yourself well then at the end of a month when drinking water from the same carafe you would kill the person who drank with you without your perceiving otherwise than from slight inconvenience that there was any poisonous substance mingled with this water do you know any other counter poisons i do not i have often read and read again the history of mithridates said madame de villefort in a tone of reflection and had always considered it a fable no madame contrary to most history it is true but what you tell me madame what you inquire of me is not the result of a chance query for two years ago you asked me the same questions and said then that for a very long time this history of mithridates had occupied your mind true sir the two favourite studies of my youth were botany and mineralogy and subsequently when i learned that the use of simples frequently explained the whole history of a people and the entire life of individuals in the east as flowers betoken and symbolize a love affair i have regretted that i was not a man that i might have been a flamel a fontana or a cabanis and the more madame said monte cristo as the orientals do not confine themselves as did mithridates to make a cuirass of his poisons but they also made them a dagger science becomes in their hands not only a defensive weapon but still more frequently an offensive one the one serves against all their physical sufferings the other against all their enemies with opium belladonna brucaea snakewood and the cherry laurel they put to sleep all who stand in their way there is not one of those women egyptian turkish or greek whom here you call good women who do not know how by means of chemistry to stupefy a doctor and in psychology to amaze a confessor really said madame de villefort whose eyes sparkled with strange fire at this conversation oh yes indeed madame continued monte cristo the secret dramas of the east begin with a love philtre and end with a death potion begin with paradise and end with hell there are as many elixirs of every kind as there are caprices and peculiarities in the physical and moral nature of humanity and i will say further the art of these chemists is capable with the utmost precision to accommodate and proportion the remedy and the bane to yearnings for love or desires for vengeance but sir remarked the young woman these eastern societies in the midst of which you have passed a portion of your existence are as fantastic as the tales that come from their strange land a man can easily be put out of the way there then it is indeed the baghdad and bassors of the thousand and one nights the sultans and viziers who rule over society there and who constitute what in france we call the gouvernement are really haroun al rashids and glaffars who not only pardon a poisoner but even make him a prime minister if his crime has been an ingenious one and who under such circumstance have the whole story written in letters of gold to divert their hours of idleness and ennui 
"'By no means, madame. The fanciful exists no longer in the East. There, disguised under other names, and concealed under other costumes, are police agents, magistrates, attorneys general, and bailiffs. They hang, behead, and impale their criminals in the most agreeable possible manner. But some of these, like clever rogues, have contrived to escape human justice and succeed in their fraudulent enterprises by cunning stratagems. Amongst us a simpleton possessed by the demon of hate or cupidity, who has an enemy to destroy, or some near relation to dispose of, goes straight to the grocers or druggists, gives a false name, which leads more easily to his detection than his real one, and under the pretext that the rats prevent him from sleeping, purchases five or six grams of arsenic. If he is really a cunning fellow, he goes to five or six different druggists or grocers, and thereby becomes only five or six times more easily traced. Then when he has acquired his specific, he administers duly to his enemy, or near kinsman, a dose of arsenic, which would make a mammoth or mastodon burst, and which, without rhyme or reason, makes his victim utter groans which alarm the entire neighbourhood. Then arrive a crowd of policemen and constables. They fetch a doctor, who opens the dead body and collects from the entrails and stomach a quantity of arsenic in a spoon. Next day, a hundred newspapers relate the fact, with the names of the victim and the murderer. The same evening the grocer or grocers, druggists or drogists, come and say, it was I who sold the arsenic to the gentleman, and rather than not recognize the guilty purchaser, they will recognize twenty. Then the foolish criminal is taken, imprisoned, interrogated, confronted, confounded, condemned, and cut off by hemp or steel, or if she be a woman of any consideration, they lock her up for life. This is the way in which you northerns understand chemistry, madame. Derues was, however, I must confess, more skilful. "'What would you have, sir?' said the lady, laughing. "'We do what we can. All the world is not the secret of the Medicis or the Borgias.' "'Now,' replied the Count, shrugging his shoulders, "'shall I tell you the cause of all these stupidities? "'It is because, at your theatres by what at least I could judge by reading the pieces they play, they see persons swallow the contents of a file, or suck the button of a ring and fall dead instantly. Five minutes afterwards the curtain falls, and the spectators depart. They are ignorant of the consequences of the murder. They see neither the police commissary with his badge of office, nor the corporal with his four men, and so the poor fools believe that the whole thing is as easy as lying. But go a little way from France. Go either to Aleppo or Cairo, or only to Naples or Roma, and you will see people passing by you in the streets, people erect, smiling, and fresh-coloured, of whom Asmodeus, if you were holding on by the skirt of his mantle, would say, that man was poisoned three weeks ago. He will be a dead man in a month. Then, remarked Madame de Villefort, they have again discovered the secret of the famous Aquatofana that they said was lost at Perugia. Ah, but, madame, does mankind ever lose anything? The arts change about and make a tour of the world. Things take a different name, and the vulgar do not follow them. That is all. But there is always the same result. Poisons act particularly on some organ or another. One on the stomach, another on the brain, another on the intestines. Well, the poison brings on a cough, the cough an inflammation of the lungs, or some other complaint catalogued in the book of science, which, however, by no means precludes it from being decidedly mortal and if it were not, would be sure to become so, 
thanks to the remedies applied by foolish doctors who are generally bad chemists and which will act in favour of or against the malady as you please and then there is a human being killed according to all the rules of art and skill and of whom justice learns nothing as was said by a terrible chemist of my acquaintance the worthy abbe adelmonte of taormina in sicily who has studied these national phenomena very profoundly it is quite frightful but deeply interesting said the young lady motionless with attention i thought i must confess that these tales were inventions of the middle ages yes no doubt but improved upon by ours what is the use of time rewards of merit medals crosses montheon prizes if they do not lead society towards one more complete perfection yet man will never be perfect until he learns to create and destroy he does know how to destroy and that is half the battle so added madame de villefort constantly returning to her object the poisons of the borgias the medicis the reine the ruggieris and later probably that of baron de trenck whose story has been so misused by modern drama and romance were objects of art madame and nothing more replied the count do you suppose that the real savant addresses himself stupidly to the mere individual by no means science loves eccentricities leaps and bounds trials of strength fancies if i may be allowed so to term them thus for instance the excellent abbe adelmonte of whom i spoke just now made in this way some marvellous experiments really yes i will mention one to you he had a remarkably fine garden full of vegetables flowers and fruit from amongst these vegetables he selected the most simple a cabbage for instance for three days he watered this cabbage with a distillation of arsenic on the third the cabbage began to droop and turn yellow at that moment he cut it in the eyes of everybody it seemed fit for table and preserved its wholesome appearance it was only poisoned to the abbe adelmonte he then took the cabbage to the room where he had rabbits for the abbe adelmonte had a collection of rabbits cats and guinea pigs fully as fine as his collection of vegetables flowers and fruit well the abbe adelmonte took a rabbit and made it eat a leaf of the cabbage the rabbit died what magistrate would find or even venture to insinuate anything against this what procureur has ever ventured to draw up an accusation against m majondi or m florence in consequence of the rabbits cats and guinea pigs they have killed not one so then the rabbit dies and justice takes no notice this rabbit dead the abbe adelmonte has its entrails taken out by his cook and thrown on the dunghill on this dunghill is a hen who pecking these intestines is in her turn taken ill and dies the next day at the moment when she is struggling in the convulsions of death a vulture is flying by there are a good many vultures in adelmonte's country this bird darts on the dead fowl and carries it away to a rock where it dines off its prey three days afterwards this poor vulture which has been very much indisposed since that dinner suddenly feels very giddy while flying aloft in the clouds and falls heavily into a fish pond the pike eels and carp eat greedily always as everybody knows well they feast on the vulture now suppose that next day one of these eels or pike or carp poisoned at the fourth remove is served up at your table well then 
your guest will be poisoned at the fifth remove and die at the end of eight or ten days of pains in the intestines sickness or abscesses of the pylorus the doctors open the body and say with an air of profound learning the subject has died of a tumour on the liver or of typhoid fever but remarked madame de villefort all these circumstances which you link thus to one another may be broken by the least accident the vulture may not see the fowl or may fall a hundred yards from the fish pond ah that is where the art comes in to be a great chemist in the east one must direct a chance and this is to be achieved madame de villefort was in deep thought yet listened attentively but she exclaimed suddenly arsenic is indelible indestructible in whatsoever way it is absorbed it will be found again in the body of the victim from the moment when it was being taken and sufficient quantity to cause death precisely so cried monte cristo precisely so and this is what i say to my worthy adamante he reflected smiled and replied to me by a sicilian proverb which i believe is also a french proverb my son the world was not made in a day but in seven return on sunday on the sunday following i did return to him instead of having watered his cabbage with arsenic he had watered it this time with a solution of salts having their basis in strychnine strychnos colubrina as the learned term it now the cabbage had not the slightest appearance of disease in the world and the rabbit had not the smallest distrust yet five minutes afterwards the rabbit was dead the fowl pecked at the rabbit and the next day was a dead hen this time we were the vultures so we opened the bird and this time all special symptoms had disappeared there were only general symptoms there was no peculiar indication in any organ an excitement of the nervous system that was it a case of cerebral congestion nothing more the fowl had not been poisoned she had died of apoplexy apoplexy is a rare disease among fowls i believe but very common among men madame de villefort appeared more and more thoughtful it is very fortunate she observed that such substance could only be prepared by chemists otherwise all the world would be poisoning each other by chemists and persons who have a taste for chemistry said monte cristo carelessly and then said madame de villefort endeavouring by a struggle and with effort to get away from her thoughts however skilfully it is prepared crime is always crime and if it avoids human scrutiny it does not escape the eye of god the orientals are stronger than we are in the case of conscience and very prudently have no hell that is the point really madame this is a scruple which naturally must occur to a pure mind like yours but which would easily yield before sound reasoning the bad side of human thought will always be defined by the paradox of jean jacques rousseau you remember the mandarin who is killed five hundred leagues off by raising the tip of the finger man's whole life passes in doing these things and his intellect is exhausted by reflecting on them you will find very few persons who will go and brutally thrust a knife in the heart of a fellow creature or will administer to him in order to remove him from the surface of the globe on which we move with life and animation that quantity of arsenic of which we just now talked such a thing is really out of rule eccentric or stupid to attain such a point the blood must be heated to thirty six degrees the pulse be at least at ninety and the feelings excited beyond the ordinary limit but suppose one pass as it permissible in philology 
from the word itself to its softened synonym then instead of committing an ignoble assassination you make an elimination you merely and simply remove from your path the individual who is in your way and that without shock or violence without the display of the sufferings which in the case of becoming a punishment make a martyr of the victim and a butcher in every sense of the word of him who inflicts them then there will be no blood no groans no convulsions and above all no consciousness of that horrid and compromising moment of accomplishing the act then one escapes the clutch of the human law which says do not disturb society this is the mode in which they manage these things and succeed in eastern climes where there are grave and phlegmatic persons who care very little for the questions of time in conjunctures of importance yet conscience remains remarked madame de villefort in an agitated voice and with a stifled sigh yes answered monte cristo happily yes conscience does remain and if it did not how wretched we should be after every action requiring exertion it is conscience that saves us for it supplies us with a thousand good excuses of which we alone are judges and these reasons howsoever excellent in producing sleep would avail us but very little before a tribunal when we were tried for our lives thus richard the third for instance was marvellously served by his conscience after the putting away of the two children of edward the fourth in fact he could say these two children of a cruel and persecuting king who have inherited the vices of their father which i alone could perceive in their juvenile propensities these two children are impediments in my way of promoting the happiness of the english people whose unhappiness they the children would infallibly have caused thus was lady macbeth served by her conscience when she sought to give her son and not her husband whatever shakespeare may say a throne ah maternal love is a great virtue a powerful motive so powerful that it excuses a multitude of things even if after duncan's death lady macbeth had been at all pricked by her conscience madame de villefort listened with avidity to these appalling maxims and horrible paradoxes delivered by the count with that ironical simplicity which was peculiar to him after a moment's silence the lady inquired do you know my dear count she said that you are a very terrible reasoner and that you look at the world through a somewhat distempered medium have you really measured the world by scrutinies or through alembics and crucibles for you must indeed be a great chemist and the elixir you administered to my son which recalled him to life almost instantaneously oh do not place any reliance on that madame one drop of that elixir suffered to recall life to a dying child but three drops would have impelled the blood into his lungs in such a way as to have produced most violent palpitations six would have suspended his respiration and caused syncopia more so serious than that in which he was ten would have destroyed him you know madam how suddenly i snatched him from those files which he so imprudently touched is it then so terrible a poison oh no in the first place let us agree that the word poison does not exist because in medicine use is made of the most violent poisons which become according as they are employed most salutary remedies what then is it a skilful preparation of my friends the worthy abbe adelmonte who taught me the use of it oh observed madame de villefort 
It must be an admirable antispasmodic. Perfect, madame, as you have seen, replied the count, and I frequently make use of it with all possible prudence, though be it observed, he added with a smile of intelligence. Most assuredly, responded madame de Villefort in the same tone. As for me, so nervous and so subject to fainting fits, I would require a doctor Adelmonte to invent for me some means of breathing freely and tranquilizing my mind. In the fear I have of dying some fine day of suffocation. In the meanwhile, as the thing is difficult to find in France, and your abbe is not probably disposed to make a journey to Paris on my account, I must continue to use Monsieur Planche's antispasmodics, and mint and Hoffman's drops are among my favorite remedies. Here are some lozenges which I have made up on purpose. They are compounded doubly strong. Monte Cristo opened the tortoise shell box which the lady presented to him, and inhaled the odor of the lozenges with the air of an amateur who thoroughly appreciated their composition. They are indeed exquisite, he said, but as they are necessarily submitted to the process of deglutition, a function which is frequently impossible for a fainting person to accomplish, I prefer my own specific. Undoubtedly, and so should I prefer it, after the effects I have seen produced, but of course it is a secret, and I am not so indiscreet as to ask it of you. But I, said Monte Cristo, rising as he spoke, I am gallant enough to offer it to you. How kind you are! Only remember one thing. A small dose is a remedy. A large one is a poison. One drop will restore life, as you have seen. Five or six will inevitably kill. And in a way the more terrible inasmuch as, poured into a glass of wine, it would not in the slightest degree affect its flavour. But I say no more, madame. It is really as if I were prescribing for you. The clock struck half-past six, and the lady was announced, a friend of Madame de Villefort, who came to dine with her. "'If I had the honour of seeing you for the third or fourth time, Count, instead of only for the second, said Madame de Villefort, "'if I had had the honour of being your friend, instead of only having the happiness of being under an obligation to you, I should insist on detaining you to dinner, and not allow myself to be daunted by a first refusal.' "'A thousand thanks, madame,' replied Monte Cristo. "'But I have an engagement which I cannot break. "'I have promised to escort to the Academy a Greek princess of my acquaintance, "'who has never seen your grand opera, "'and who relies on me to conduct her thither.' "'Adieu, then, sir, and do not forget the prescription.' "'Ah, in truth, madame, to do that I must forget the hour's conversation I have had with you, which is indeed impossible.' Monte Cristo bowed and left the house. Madame de Villefort remained immersed in thought. "'He is a very strange man,' she said, "'and in my opinion is himself the Adelmonte he talks about.' As to Monte Cristo, the result had surpassed his utmost expectations. Good, said he, as he went away, this is a fruitful soil, and I feel certain that the seed sown will not be cast on barren ground. Next morning, faithful to his promise, he sent the prescription requested. End of chapter 52 All right, did you find support for or against our statement? What do you think of our Madame Villefort? Interesting woman, no? Goodness gracious, where did she come from? How did Dumas write her? (laughs) What inspired him? Well, there actually is some inspiration for her, which I will have to tell you about later, because I opened the page but didn't finish reading the page. (sighs) But there is information to come about who inspired our Lady Viafor. And one of the things that I have not been able to track down, and you might know this, is that casual 
line from the count late, late, late in the chapter about Lady Macbeth and her son. It sounded to me like he was implying that Mr. Macbeth was Lady Macbeth's son. I don't know where that theory would come from, because she rather clearly says that they'd had a kid together and the kid has evidently passed away. So I'm not sure about this. I have an email written to Aaron Ziegler, but I can't send it yet because it's locked inside my home network. But I will keep tracking that down for you because I think that was pretty fascinating. But the other things that I was able to research and that I am able to remember go like this, starting with the beginning of the chapter. Aqua Tofana. Now, there are lots of different ways that this gets spelled and referred to, partly because it was, well, it had to do with women. And so it kind of entered into the realm of folklore for a while. But it turns out that there was a woman in Italy who concocted a, well, a black widow poison, a way for women to do away with pesky husbands who were bugging them in a way that would allow them to completely get away with it. It was a poison. It was tasteless. It was smellless. It completely flew under the radar. And of course, the Count's explanation for how you could easily, quote unquote, get away with murder in an untraceable way by growing food in a poisonous environment, poisoned water, which is, of course, exactly what we see happening with like mercury and fish and why you don't want to put toxic things in the ground or on plants that we are therefore going to eat. This is not news to us. It may have been some sort of news to the people that were reading this book at the time it was released. But this particular poison is famous. It was either in the 1500s or 1600s that Madame Tefania was doing this. And there was some report of her having helped, I don't know, 50 women, 150 women off their husbands. Now, that's all obviously anecdotal. I don't know if any of that is true. What I do know is we know the ingredients that were in the concoction. At least we know we know the main ingredients. I know belladonna was listed as it might have been in there too, but the poison was pretty well understood. What we don't know is the amounts of those ingredients that she put into this particular poison. And that is why the statement was that this was the, the knowledge that was lost in Perugia, because that's where she was from. So the very first hint that we have that something is going on is a well-known folktale slash history of a woman who was a prolific poisoner. Not necessarily that she was doing it herself, but that she was getting the poison to women so that they could go use it. So that was one. Mithridates. Mithridates ex Ponticus. He got mentioned several times, and this goes back to, I think it was 150 to 40 BCE, I think. Somewhere around there, this guy was really a big deal. I think he was at least partially Persian in origin. He was a real thorn in the side of Rome. He got in their way. And there are several Mithridates, and so I'm probably going to get part of this wrong. But if I'm recalling this correctly, the Mithridates who lived around the 140 BC era, or may have died in the 140 BC year, he was poisoned and killed. I know one of them got poisoned and killed because his son started to take small amounts of poison in an effort to protect himself. This led to all sorts of other problems for him later when things went south. And I can't remember if they got captured or if it was imminent that they were going to be captured. But for some reason, it was one of those like, you know, you're in the bunker and you just bite the pill and decide it's over. Except he had to decide that for his wife and his kids and himself. And so he managed to release from life his wife and his two daughters. And then he went to do the same to himself. And he couldn't actually take enough poison to kill himself because he had been dosing himself for so long that he'd built up, he'd built up a tolerance to iocane powder. So that's the, the Mithridates poison story. 
uh, about drinking poison in your cup of cream every day. That's where that one came from. The reason why I had started talking about this as though it was a Snape chapter is because Nicholas Flamel is mentioned. And for those of you who like Hermione, remember the things that you read in the Harry Potter books. Flamel is mentioned in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Flamel was an alchemist and, I guess you could say scientist, uh, like all the other names that got thrown about in that section. Then they go on to talking more about the East, and a name gets mentioned that sounds an awful lot like Jafar, like from Aladdin, the movie. And it is Jafar, but it is not spelled J-A-F-A-R. It's G-I-F-F-A-E-R-E or something. Again, I can't look at it. It's one of the pages I opened but didn't actually write down any notes on. It came in a long line of names of uh, sultans, viziers, and then it went into names of specific people, and that was one of the, the names, capitalized, proper noun. The only other note I'm going to give you before I release you is this. You heard from Valentine last episode about her grandfather's condition. This is Monsieur Noitier. This is the man who'd been such a, a passionate, fiery supporter of Napoleon. His son, Vifor, was the royalist who now has done very well for himself. Noitier, we learn from Valentine, has been struck down. He's had a stroke. He's had a fit of apoplexy. We heard about that from Vifor as well when he met with. Monte Cristo. He did not sound very happy about the state that his father was in. Watching his father in this state was clearly very discomforting to Villefort. Valentine says she's the only one who can communicate with Noitier, which means whatever it is that she's doing has to be pretty slow and precise. Because the way that Madame de Villefort is describing Noitier is a little different. Talking about him, you know, barely hanging on by a thread and his mind is flickering out and he does, it's unwelcome meal. He doesn't even like the one meal that he gets during the day, which is interesting because the man that we saw before, it is kind of hard to imagine him being all faded out mentally. I mean, anybody can be trapped by their body. That I get. But, hmm. Valentine does not seem to talk about him as though he is weak-minded at all. So we have an interesting dichotomy being set up here. We also have a discussion of many different kinds of poison. We also have the Count talking about how easy it would be to feed someone food that was poisonous, not food that had poison put on it. This would completely defy the need for a, a king to have a taster, somebody who tastes their food <laughs> so that they can drop dead if somebody's trying to poison the king. Because by the time you'd eaten the food, you'd be fine. When you start to digest the food, you might feel a little icky, but that's going to be hours after the meal. And then later, you'd die. Very clever way to do it. Those are the pieces of information that we have right now. And those are are the pieces of information from which you can draw some conclusions. And on that note, I will let you go ponder and revel in the awesomeness of this book. Because this was such a cool chapter. I love this chapter. <sighs> Chapters like this just make me happy. Which, which sounds so wrong now that I hear it coming out of my mouth. Wow, people who love poison. That's awesome. Let's read more about awful people. But but it's fun. And we learned a lot. Almost. <laughs> because I didn't have my complete set of notes. Oh, well. Next week, I'll fill you in on anything that I left out. I will also put links to all of these things in the show notes for this episode 438. I hope you have a great week. I am going to go get a flipping modem right now. And I'll talk to you later. Take care. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like getting free audiobooks with benefits every week, please consider supporting the show over at patreon.com slash craftlet. There are rewards waiting for you beyond, you know, the free podcast. You can also subscribe to our premium streaming audio by tapping the red lock when you are looking at the app or at the show notes at craftlet.libsyn.com slash 
podcast. You can also sign up for a premium download subscription by following the links in the right-hand sidebar at craftlit.com. And if it's easier for you, you can always subscribe and review at iTunes and at Stitcher Radio. Like us on Facebook, support us at Patreon, and come with us on tour. For nine years, Craftlit has been kept going by the support of you, the listener. And for that, I am truly grateful. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.